Oh, come in. <coughs> come away in, come in. Good to see you. It's been a little while. I've been away. I actually down in the West Country again. I was down in Mulberry. Do have a seat. Now, <coughs> last time I came back, we were, we were kind of, I had been going to talk to you, hadn't I, about the, the glorious uh, trip to the River Dart and Ted Hughes's favourite fishing spot. And then we talked about, well, can we talk about these things at all with this dreadful crisis? And we, we reached deep into that marvellous piece by C.S. Lewis, Learning in Wartime. Uh, and I said at the end that I would, after all, read you the fishing poems because we must always not only preserve but positively celebrate the arts of peace, uh, all the more so on the precipice of war, all the more so to do the things that, uh, that are intrinsically worthwhile and not to capitulate to sort of nerves or fear. So, um, so that's exactly what we shall do. So, um, I have my beloved Sherlock Holmes, Peterson Sherlock Holmes Lestrade. It's almost my favourite pipe, I think. So here we go. There's the Hughes letters and Jonathan Bates' biography of him up there. And I'm very much looking forward to getting my... Uh, there's a great Hughes expert. He's a friend of mine, Mark Wormald at, at Pembroke College. And he is about to produce a book called... Um, Fishing for Ted Hughes, um, which is going to be a celebration of all these things, so that'll be fab. Um, coming out at the end of April, I think. So this is this is my big Ted Hughes collected poems. It's quite a a weight. I love it. There's some great comments on the back when this came out. It's like I love this from Andrew Motion, who was then poet laureate, I think. Reading Ted Hughes' collected poems <clears throat> is like handling a chunk of Stonehenge. Massive, handsome, compelling and magical. Ted Hughes would probably have liked that to have been said about himself as well as his poems. He was a big, broad, massive man. And um, so it's, it's, uh, it's fabulous. And it has this collection, River, in it, which came out in 1983. And... Um, I I didn't buy it at the time, even though I was I'd stopped being a student by then. I was a teacher, but I was quite a poor teacher. I was, you know, probationary teacher, I think, in a comprehensive. And it kept, River came out originally as a big hardback, sort of almost like a coffee table book. It was the first time Hughes had done, apart from doing the illustrations that Leonard Baskin did for his book Crow. It's certainly the first time I think he'd done books with photographs. And there was a photographer who was a fellow fisherman that used to go around with you. And he produced these magnificent photographs of the various rivers, the Dart included, of course, but many other rivers as well, the Dee and the Tay and so on. And um, uh, so you got the poems and the pictures and there was a sort of reflection between them. Anyway, I never, I never rose to the cost of that book, um, but um, <clears throat> I ought to have it now, I just didn't. But then I got this, this massive Stonehenge chunk book instead. <clears throat> so Hughes, um, well, as you know, Hughes is a great, uh, a great nature poet, um, and of course owes a lot, like all nature poets do, to the Romantics and to, to Wordsworth. I think his philosophy maybe owes more to Coleridge, but but he takes a new. He's 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 darker. He's more kind of visceral. I remember the first Ted Hughes poem I ever read, which was also characteristically about a fish. It was the one called Pike. I was. A teenager at school, I just got the selected Ted Hughes and Tom Gunn off the shelf. I bought that afterwards, I still have it. And it was a poem about a pike. And it, But it started with this little pike, like a little baby pike in a jar. And it goes, pike, perfect pike, three inches long, green tigering the gold. So it's this tiny little thing, green tigering the gold, is wonderful. But then it says, at one point, one line in the poem is, a hundred foot long in his world. And it suddenly takes you into the submarine world in which the pike, you know, once it's fully grown, compared with all the other little minnows, you suddenly see the pike as a hundred feet. It's one of those vertiginous shifts of perspective of which poetry is perhaps even more capable than photography or cinematography. Anyway, all the text of River is in here. And I really want to read you the poem I alluded to um, at, the, at the end of our session last time, which is simply called That Morning. 
and is really about a moment uh, that can only be described as a moment of epiphany. But I thought as a way in, I'd, um, I'd read you his poem in the same book, the same sequence, which is simply called Go Fishing. And it's a series of, of present tense imperatives. It's almost like a kind of a sort of sage or a, or a shaman telling you what to do to get into a certain state. Yes, go fishing, but join water, wade in under being, lose words, be assumed into the glistening lymph of the river. It's wonderful. Now, um, it's been remarked by people who knew him that when Hughes went fishing, which he did for hours on an end, I mean, here he was, a supreme wielder and welder of words, but he, ass he, uh, he assumed he kind of entered into a wordless state so completely experiencing nature, as it were, without the intervening veil of language, that for some time after fishing, he would actually find it difficult to speak. He, he was speechless. And um, then he would gradually sort of return. And what he does in this poem, Go Fishing, is miraculously and paradoxically use his words, it must be some time after he'd come out of the trance, as it were, to try and describe to you, and more than describe to you, to evoke in you that wordless state. And it's perhaps it's a good prelude to the extraordinary epiphany that's in the poem that morning. So let's, let's just hear Go Fishing first. Join water, wade in underbeing, let brain mist into moist earth, ghost loosen away downstream, gulp river and gravity, lose words. Cease. Be assumed into glistenings of lymph, as if creation were a wound, as if this flow were all plasm healing. Be supplanted by mud and leaves and pebbles, by sudden rainbow monster structures that materialise in suspension, gulping and dematerialise under pressure of the eye. Be cleft by the sliding prow, Displaced by the hull of light and shadow, dissolved in earth wave, the soft sun shock, dismembered in sun melt, become translucent, one untangling drift of water mesh, and a weight of earth taste, light, mangled by wing shadows, everything circling and flowing and hover still. Crawl out over roots new and nameless, search for face, harden into limbs, let the world come back, like a white hospital, busy with urgency words. Try to speak and nearly succeed, heal into time and other people. Uh, the journey out of self, almost out of the kind of identity of your consciousness within the concavity of your skull or the particularities of your body so that your thinking being your brain is misting out into moist earth your ghost as it were your spirit is loosening away down striver, downstream in a sense you almost become the river but it's really interesting in all of that that he twice uses the word heal or rather he uses the word healing and then he ends with the last line beginning with the word heal, where he says, as if this flow, earlier on he says, as if this flow, it's not just the flow of the river now, it's the flow of being that he's in, as if this flow were all plasm healing, and um, then come, becomes translucent, and then comes back, the word, the earth feels like a hospital, try to speak and nearly succeed, heal into time, it's almost as he's been out of time and now he heals into time. It's um, it's very beautiful, possibly a slight play on the word heel as well, because there's the boat image, there's, there's wading out in waders to fish, but surely be cleft by the sliding prow, displaced by the hull of light and shadow, dissolved in earth wave. There's, there's a bit of a sort of boat feeling there as well. Anyway, that gives you an idea, I think, of the way in which he both literally and, if you like, 
spiritually and almost metaphysically immersed himself. I mean, he literally immersed himself in the river, immersed himself in the experience of the fishing. So anyway, uh, we didn't do that when we were down by the dark. We walked by the river, and in that sense, we were distinct from it. But I love gazing on rivers, and if I gaze on them for any amount of time, there is a sense in which I feel all everything suddenly becomes river. Everything, as you know, as Heraclitus says, panta ray, everything flows. So um, <clears throat> anyway, this particular poem is not about the River Dart, as you'll see from the, the appearance in it of the wonderful bears. Um, there aren't any bears coming down to the shores of the Dart. But this was in Alaska, and he was fishing with his son, Nicholas, to whom the whole river book is dedicated. Um, I misremember the title of this poem for a long time. I, I, I kind of, would have thought, thought it was called Sunday Morning. I thought, why is that? Uh, and that's, I think, because it is such a, a golden, epiphanous kind of Sabbath, if you like, but almost eternal resurrection experience in it, that it, that it seems to be a hallowed morning. He doesn't say what day it is, he just calls it that morning. So here we go. Uh, I think this is one of Hughes's finest poems. Indeed, I'd say one of the finest uh, poems of the 20th century. That morning. We came where the salmon were so many, so steady, so spaced, so far aimed on their inner map. England could add only the sooty twilight of South Yorkshire, hung with the drumming drift of Lancaster's, till the world had seemed capsizing slowly. Solemn to stand there in the pollen light, waist deep in wild salmon, swaying, massed as from the hand of God. There, the body separated, golden and imperishable from its doubting thought, a spirit beacon lit by the power of the salmon that came on, came on, and kept on coming, as if we flew slowly, their formations lifting us towards some dazzle of blessing one wrong thought might darken, as if the fallen world and salmon were over, as if these were the imperishable fish that had let the world pass away, there, in a mauve light of drifted lupins, they hung in the cupped hands of the mountain made of tingling atoms. It had happened. Then, for a sign that we were where we were, two gold bears came down and swam like men beside us and dived like children and stood in deep water as on a throne eating pierced salmon off their talons. So we found the end of our journey. So we stood, alive in the river of light, among the creatures of light. Creatures of light. Oh, so, so beautiful. At the end, among all these creatures of light, just for a moment, we too were creatures of light. And, um, you know, he, he can he does great mythic and mythopoeic poetry, but he can do doubt and difficulty and all of that as well. But he submits gladly as a poet to this epiphany. And he talks about the the body. It's interesting, a lesser poet would have said the soul is separated, golden and imperishable. But no, he says the body separated, golden and imperishable. Separated from what? Separated from its doubting thought. It's as though all the... Maybe oh, I'm a bit sceptical. All, all that's just suddenly completely set aside. And what he understands is that everything, including these salmon, swaying mast, are as from the hand of God. You know, there's this extraordinary sense of the source. And they're almost that the world might pass away, but then, then they realise where they are. They, they, he's one with the river and the mountains made of tingling atoms. And for a sign that we were where we were in Alaska... The two cold bears come down. And it's so beautiful at the very end when he says there's the river of light and light rhymes with itself in the final couplet. Uh, so the airliner was, so we stood alive in the river of light. And then among the creatures of light, creatures of light. And of course, syntactically it's saying we too among the creatures of light were creatures of light. But by working it out the way he does, he gets this repetition 
just mm. of the phrase creatures of light, like a kind of litany. And uh, there is something powerful, particularly about the notion of the end of the journey. I don't think this is just a poem about one morning on a river. Uh, it certainly is that, and it, it doesn't lose anything of its specifics. But the end of our journey is such a resonant phrase. And for me, it's a kind of glimpse of everything as the old theologians used to say, subspecie eternitatis, under the, under the mode of eternity, seeing things as they are in their eternal being and discovering that we, even we, in all our different darknesses, might be among the creatures of light. Creatures of light. Wonderful. Thanks for dropping by. <laughs>